Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. Today we would like to, for the first time in any of our videos, take a moment to thank everyone who supported our channel, and especially our Patreons, both past and present. In the near future, we are going to reorganize our Patreon page, and set up tiers in an attempt to give our Patreons greater access to things like Patreon-only Q&A podcasts, bonus materials that didn't end up making it into any of our videos, previews of upcoming content, as well as the scripts that we're already posting. And starting today, there will be a Patreon-only post where we will be taking suggestions about other things that our patrons might be interested in. So, if you are interested in supporting our channel and would like to be involved in the upgrade of our Patreon page, the link is in the description below. Now let's turn our attention to the business at hand. Today we are going to begin breaking down the pre-released excerpt from Fire and Blood that George put online last week. Sorry that we weren't able to get this done in a single video, but as we were going through it, it quickly became apparent that there was pretty much something in every single paragraph that we wanted to talk about. So, let's not waste any time here. Let's do this. Several years had passed since the king had last made a progress, so plans were laid in 58 AC for Jaharis and Alisan to make their first visit to Winterfell and the north. Their dragons would be with them, of course, but beyond the neck the distances were great and the roads poor, and the king had grown tired of flying ahead and waiting for his escort to catch up. This time, he decreed, his Kingsguard, servants, and retainers would go ahead of him to make things ready for his arrival. And thus it was that three ships set sail from King's Landing for White Harbor, where he and the Queen were to make their first stop. Okay, so this excerpt takes place ten years into Jaehaerys' reign, in the year 58 AC. Jaehaerys and his Queen, Alisanne, decided that it had been too long since his last royal progress, a decision that might have been influenced by Jaehaerys' new hand, Septim Barth, who was named to the position that very year. It was a tradition his grandfather Aegon had started, likely because he recognized how important it is for a ruler to understand the daily lives and struggles of the people they rule. As we've stated a few times in previous videos, George believes that a good ruler should live and rule for their people. And what better way is there to accomplish this than by actually meeting the people you're living and ruling for? Unfortunately, the later kings of Aegon's dynasty seem to have lost sight of the importance of this practice. And without these royal progresses to guide them, the quality of the leadership these later monarchs provided dwindled as they became more and more detached from the day-to-day -day lives of those they ruled. Granted, it was a lot easier to accomplish traveling all about the realm when the kings had dragons, but the point remains the same. This first paragraph also gives us an idea of just how difficult it was to travel throughout Westeros prior to Jaehaerys ordering a new network of roads to be built that connect the Seven Kingdoms to King's Landing. Jaehaerys clearly recognized the fact that making travel in and between the once seven quarrelsome kingdoms safer, faster, and easier would also increase trade and interactions between the kingdoms, which in turn would forge seven kingdoms into one. And the struggles his retinues faced on these royal progresses might very well have been what led him to this conclusion. The gods in the free cities had other plans, however. Even as the king's ships were beating their way north, envoys from Pentos and Tyrosh called upon his grace in the Red Keep. The two cities had been at war for three years, and were now desirous of making peace, but could not agree on where they might meet to discuss terms. The conflict had caused serious disruption to trade upon the Narrow Sea, 
to the extent that King Jaharis had offered both cities his help in ending their hostilities. After long discussion, the Archon of Tyrosh and the Prince of Pentos had agreed to meet in King's Landing to settle their differences, provided that Jaharis would act as an intermediary between them and guarantee the terms of any resulting treaty. It was a proposal that neither the king nor his council felt he could refuse, but it would mean postponing his grace's planned progress to the north, and there was concern that the notoriously prickly Lord of Winterfell might take that for a slight. Queen Alisane provided the solution. She would go ahead as planned, alone, whilst the king played host to the prince and archon. Jaharis could join her at Winterfell as soon as the peace had been concluded. And so it was agreed. Now, George deciding to word the timing of Tyrosh and Pentos' decision to act on their desire for peace, to perfectly coincide with Jaharis' departure to the north, as the Free Cities and the Gods had other plans, does kind of make you think that the Free Cities were not exactly fond of the idea of a united and very powerful Westeros, right across the narrow sea from them. It might have been hoping that disrupting his royal progress to the north, the most isolated and least tied to the Seven Kingdoms region of Westeros, might so dissent. After all, this would not be the only time the Free Cities used their power to unsettle Westeros as Lys and Pentos lent crucial aid to Dorne during Daemon the Young Dragon's reign. And it flat out says that both Tyrosh and Pentos wanted to end hostilities, and chose the exact moment Jaehaerys was supposed to leave to show up and accept his offer to broker a peace. Or it could have just been colorful language. But it does seem that there was something to gain for the Free Cities if they managed to sow division in Westeros. Unfortunately for them, they didn't realize how accomplished a diplomat Queen Alisane would prove to be. Queen Alisane's travels began in the city of White Harbor, where tens of thousands of northerners turned out to cheer her and gape at Silverwing with awe and a bit of terror. It was the first time any of them had ever seen a dragon. The size of the crowds surprised even their lord. I had not known there were so many small folk in the city, Theomar Manderly is reported to have said. Where did they all come from? This is a very interesting little piece of information. Where did all of these people come from? It seems incredibly unlikely that Lord Manderly has no idea how many people live in his city or his domain, which seems to indicate that people came from all over the north to greet the queen and her dragon when she arrived. That seems to be in direct contrast to the way it is said the North viewed the Targaryens. But anyways... The Manderleys were unique amongst the great houses of the North. Having originated in the Reach centuries before, they had found refuge near the mouth of the White Knife when rivals drove them from their rich lands along the Mander. Though fiercely loyal to the Starks of Winterfell, they had brought their own gods with them from the south, and still worshipped the Seven and kept the traditions of knighthood. Alisane Targaryen, ever desirous of binding the Seven Kingdoms closer together, saw an opportunity in Lord Theomor's famously large family, and promptly set about arranging marriages. By the time she took her leave, Two of her ladies-in-waiting had been betrothed to his lordship's younger sons, and a third to a nephew. His eldest daughter and three nieces, meanwhile, had been added to the queen's own party, with the understanding that they would travel south with her and there be pledged to suitable lords and knights of the king's court. So, here you see one of the real purposes of these royal progresses. They are realm-binding missions, and in a feudal world such as Westeros, the best way to bind the realm together is through inner-kingdom marriages. Here, Alisane is doing exactly that, arranging marriages with a family that are among the staunchest Stark supporters, who also happen to be powerful and rich, with families in the south. 
How she managed to get highborn girls from families esteemed enough to have daughters in the queen's own retinue to marry second and third sons of a northern lord without protest from their families is a bit of a mystery. But nonetheless, it was done and would be instrumental in finishing the work Aegon the Conqueror started, transforming Westeros from a place where two or three of the seven kingdoms were at war with one another at any given moment into one kingdom of relative peace and prosperity. Lord Manderley entertained the Queen lavishly. At the welcoming feast, an entire oryx was roasted, and his lordship's daughter, Jessamine, acted as the Queen's cupbearer, filling her tankard with a strong northern ale that her grace pronounced finer than any wine she had ever tasted. Manderley also staged a small tourney in the Queen's honor to show the prowess of his knights. One of the fighters though no knight, was revealed to be a woman, a wildling girl who had been captured by rangers north of the Wall and given to one of Lord Manderley's household knights to foster. Delighted by the girl's daring, Alisane summoned her own sworn shield, Jonquil Dark, and the wildling and the scarlet shadow dueled spear against sword, whilst the Northmen roared in approval. A few days later, the Queen convened her woman's court in Lord Manderley's own hall, a thing hitherto unheard of in the North, and more than two hundred women and girls gathered to share their thoughts, concerns, and grievances with Her Grace. Okay, so going back to one of our very first points, the purpose of royal progresses are to give the King, or in this case his Queen, the opportunity to learn of the plights and struggles of the people. And here we see Alisane doing exactly that. She held an unprecedented court for the women of the North and listened to their concerns. This seems likely to have been where the Lord's right to first night died its long overdue death. I would imagine that none of the girls or women were fond of this practice and this was likely the first time they ever had the opportunity to voice their displeasure. Alsane, like Aegon the Conqueror's sister queens before her, also appears to have been the type that didn't give the rigid gender roles of Life Under the Seven much, if any, heed, as she is clearly here in the North acting with the Crown's authority, just like Rhaenys and Visenya did during Aegon's reign. She even had a female sworn shield, and was thrilled to learn that one of the competitors in Lord Manderley's tourney was actually a wilding woman, and immediately had her own sworn shield square off with her, much to the delight of the Northmen who were in attendance. After taking leave of White Harbor, the Queen's retinue sailed up the White Knife to its rapids, then proceeded overland to Winterfell, whilst Alisane herself flew ahead on Silverwing. The warmth of her reception at White Harbor was not to be duplicated at the ancient seat of the Kings in the North, where Alaric Stark and his sons alone emerged to greet her when her dragon landed before his castle gates. Lord Alaric had a flinty reputation, a hard man, people said, stern and unforgiving, tight-fisted, almost to the point of being niggardly, humorless, joyless, cold. Even Theomor Manderley, who was his bannerman, had not disagreed. Stark was well respected in the North, he said, but not loved. Lord Manderley's fool had put it elsewise. Methinks Lord Alaric has not moved his bowels since he was twelve. Her reception at Winterfell did nothing to disabuse the Queen's fears, as to what she might expect from House Stark. Even before dismounting to bend the knee, Lord Alaric looked askance at Her Grace's clothing and said, I hope you brought something warmer than that. So, Alisane has finally made it to Winterfell, and I've got to admit that I freaking love this Alaric Stark guy. I mean, this gorgeous, dragon-riding queen arrives at his castle, and he doesn't even call on anyone other than his sons to go out and meet her. And the first thing he said to her was basically, You're not planning on wearing that, are you? But before I go off on a tangent about how much I love this guy, 
we're going to have to cut this off here and pick back up with Alisane charming the pants off this gruff Northman and turning what could have been a precarious situation into a major victory for House Targaryen and the realm as a whole.